And thank you for having me and for coming out on this day. And, and if you've ever gone to the White Mountains, this is the perfect day. This is the way the, the weather is like, nine days out of 10. And, uh, and so um, anyway, so what I'm here today to talk about is uh, a book that, that I, I did with Nancy, my wife, and she, she had a very strong hand in everything here, um, as did my kids, as, you, as you'll see. And this is actually the... Uh, it's the sixth version of the book. Uh, in we first book was done in 1995, and ev roughly every five years is an updated version. And after the first two editions, they rebranded it as Best, Best Day Hikes. Um, so anyway, um, let's see. Here, so the original one was called Nature Hikes in the White Mountains. Um, and that was done in 1995, and then. Uh, we, every couple of years we did an update, and uh, the, uh, this is the latest issue that came out, actually came out in 2022, um, and so it se still seems to be going strong. Can you hear? Can you? Yeah, very well. Uh, or, is that better? Oh, wow. All right. Um, so the, um, I guess what I could do is start out is talk about how this book came about, and uh, these are people who play key roles, my family, Nancy, Allison, and Gabriel. There's a group of AMC naturalists. There was a program that uh, we would go to the huts, the AMC Appalachian Mountain Club huts up in the, in the White Mountains, these high elevation huts that are full service and you can get bunks uh, and stay overnight. And there's a program where, where uh, the net, there was a group of volunteer naturalists who would go there. We would sing for our supper. Uh, in, in essence, we'd, get, we'd do a program or two at the huts in exchange for uh, room and board. Um, Walter Graff and Nancy Rick were two um, AMC staff people. Walter's retired. He was a vice president. And Nancy Ritger is still working there at the Highland Center in, in Crawford Notch. She's still the program person there. And they provided a lot of advice and encouragement. Steve Smith is the uh, guru of hiking in the White Mountains. If you've ever seen the really thick 600 hikes of uh, AMC White Mountain Guide, that's, Steve has been the latest author of that, and he's just an incredible resource and reviewed stuff. Um, Dykes Oostrin is a professor of geology at uh, Bates College who reviewed some of the sections where I talk about geology. Um, editors at AMC Books, the way, the way this book really came about was Gordon Hardy is a friend of ours um, who uh, um, happened to be at the time was the editor of AMC Books and knew that I was an AMC naturalist. And at one point, <clears throat> this was before we even had any children, so it was before 1993, he said, you know, it would really be nice to have a book for families uh, you know, who are no longer, uh, let's say, the, or the people who now have children so that maybe they can't do you know, uh, the really rigorous hikes, but still want to get up there. And I kind of, and he was kind of looking at me, and he knew I was part of that. And so um, I said, well, I think maybe I can do that. And so that's, in essence, how it happened. And uh, you know, start, we started out with that small version, which only had 44 hikes, because I sort of ran out of gas, and we needed to get into publication at the time. But now it's 60 hikes. and and. We've been going uh, through it ever since, every five years. Um, and um, photographers, you see a lot of pictures that are in the book. 
uh, or some, most of them, or a lot of them I took or Nancy took, and then some of them are done by uh, friends, and some of them are done by professional photographers or AMC, people AMC uses. Uh, and the last two couples on the list are people we stayed with. Uh, so Leslie and Gary live in the West, West Bethel, so they're in the kind of the Evans Notch section of the White Mountains, and, and Ed Quinlan and Leslie Nelk live in sort of the general area of Waterville Valley, they're in Thornton, and so we would often stay with them, and they would give us advice and go hiking with us. Um, anyway, if, if you're not familiar with the White Mountains, we're in northern, north central New Hampshire. Uh, it's a national forest, uh, one, of the, one of the first national forests in the east when I guess the people in Washington, D.C. just realize that, hey, there are national areas of national significance in the east. It's just not all out in the west. So it's that whole central area of, the, of New Hampshire um, that we're talking about, and it's a very large area. Um, and this is the, the, the latest edition. Is, um, this is a kind of a locator map for the different hikes there. Are. Like I said, there are 60 in there now. Um, and uh, you can see they're spread out from pretty much from west to east throughout the whole area uh, of the White Mountains, up, up through the North Country region, well, Kilkenny region up on top there, down through Waterville Valley and east and west. And, and so it's a, tries to, I tried to go for geographical variety because sometimes if you come, depending on where you're coming from, sometimes it's easier to get to certain parts of the White Mountains than others. Um, and, and this is just a, a, my hat's off to the volunteer naturalists. Uh, yeah. This happens to be a, of somebody, Daryl Borst, who is a professor at Quinnipiac University who was giving us a, a lecture at the time. And this is somewhere a, just outside of the Highland Center, actually, around Amanusik Lake. And he was talking about freshwater sponges, which are uh, it was just it was great to be with this group of lively naturalists who knew each of us contributed things from our own area of expertise or, and enthusiasm. And uh, they, they certainly have a, had a strong influence on the, this book. OK, and this was a family project um, starting in 1994. And if you've ever met our daughter, that's her at age one. <laughs> and here she is already doing uh, her own hike. And she, she contributed a lot to the latest edition. Uh, as I've gotten too old to do some of the hikes, uh, my son and daughter have really uh, stepped up and helped, helped in, in the latest uh, edition. So, And here's our son at, at, at looking up at the Mount Pembroke-Russick Trail. And, and this is the same. Same, same person, it looks a little different than 2021. <laughs> so is, what makes a favorite hike? Um, this is something, uh, yeah, and I think we all have our, what we like about hiking or what we want, want to see. And these are just some um, thoughts that uh, I, have, I had about what, what, what makes a hike a, fake, a, a, a favorite. Um, and it, it could be something like, uh, Going to a peak in Vista, clearly uh, high in everyone's list. That's one of the reasons you go up to the mountains is to get a beautiful vista of something. Um, and then uh, typically water features are good, particularly when you're hiking with children. They just, um, you don't necessarily always want to walk through a tunnel of what's called a tunnel of trees, but you want something interesting along the way, like streams, lakes, cascades. Um, and there's a whole section of the book that is hiking with children. Because the book really started out in the first two editions, which were called Nature Hikes, was really all about family hiking and what makes families, tra trails that were uh, appropriate for families. And then um, later, when they rebranded it they, as Best Day Hikes, we added more rigorous hikes. So, for example, we didn't have Mount Washington in there until the, they rebranded it because they didn't feel that was an appropriate family hike. But when we rebranded it, we put Mount Washington in and some of the 4, 000, more of the 4,000 footers. Um, so nature treats, and we, somewhere, we have an appendix that has a whole section on nature, uh, which goes through the geology, fauna, and flora. Uh, hikes to huts, 
there's, there's a whole wonderful culture of, and, of that the Appalachian Mountain Club has of there's eight backcountry huts where you can stay overnight, uh, give you meals, breakfast and dinner, and get information, meet the very energetic uh, crew who uh, will help uh, entertain you as well as feed you and keep you warm. And finally, there's, of course, there's a, people want seclusion. They want, want to find a place that they're the first one to. Well, unfortunately, that, <laughs> got, that, that one hasn't happened anymore, particularly with the pandemic. We discovered how popular the mountains were. Um, and so some of the trails had originally said, well, this is a good one because you're not going to run into too many people. Well, you may run into a few more uh, in 2023. Uh, but nonetheless, there are some places that are less, a little more off the beaten track than others. So there's a section there, and this is Nancy's invention, <laughs> a suggestion. And they must say they do this. AMC started this. This was the first one in an AMC Best Day Hikes guide, and they have one now for a lot of the region. There's Berkshires, there's New Greater New York, there's Philadelphia, there's around the capital area, there's southern New Hampshire, Vermont. But this is standard now of this matrix where you can get a very quick look at um, a hike, uh, whether difficulty rating is, uh, the round trip distance, the elevation gain, and um, how long it should take, which is always kind of depends on you, but it's an estimate. And then some of the highlights and then some of the features. Um, so that's uh, standard now. All right, so let's talk about peaks and vist vistas, hikes to peaks and vistas. This is looking north. Uh, from Mount Passaconaway, which is one of the 4,000 footers and uh, certainly a lovely place to go. It's not too bad a hike um, in terms of difficulty rating, but uh, it is a, it's just a, a great way to enjoy, enjoy nature and, and be out there and get a great view of sort of feeling in the mountains, looking out that Mount Carrigan is the most prominent lump there on the left I guess it would be on your, your left side of your screen. And uh, then there's water, uh, waterfalls. These are different ones, so different waterfalls. There's Tama Falls. Uh, the Fallsway Trail is one that's up in the north, northern part of the White Mountains. That's um, uh, off of, uh, in the northern presidential area. And it, it goes, if you wanted to keep continuing that, you'd, you'd go up to Mount Madison and Madison Hut. Uh, Mount Adams, but uh, along the way you pass a wonderful series of waterfalls. Um, uh, too, ma too many waterfalls to, to count even. Um, and Greeley Pond is a very popular walk uh, off of the Can either off of the Kankamangas Highway, which is a large a long east-west highway, more or less in the southern part of the White Mountains. Um, and but you can also approach approach it from Waterville Valley, and you can actually and it's it's uh, a good place for cross-country skiing in winter. You know, one of the things they, they, um, that I did put in the book, and it was encouraged by um, the editors, it was uh, winter as well as summer hiking. So what, what's good, what areas you could ski in, snowshoe in. And for that, I really had to rely on uh, testimony of other people, since most of our hiking is really done during, we, do, we certainly have done cross-country skiing, but I got a lot of advice from people like Steve Smith and, and others about what would be also appropriate for winter, winter hiking. And hikes with children, there are certain ones that are hikes. They, this is uh, the one on the, your left is uh, called the Basin Cascade Trail. Um, and uh, we, we just like, the children like just staring at the, and we like staring at where flowing water. And the one on the right is uh, my children. When that was probably around 2009, I think we did that hike, and that's actually the uh, Falling Waters Trail, which goes up to Mount Lafayette. Uh, eventually, uh, it's a wonderful hike. And you, the nice thing about some of these hikes, at least in the book, is that you can do part of it. So that, for for example, the the one where I described the Falling Waters Trail, which is you can do a very one of the classic loops in the White Mountains is go up the Falling Waters Trail, up to Franconia Ridge, go across, 
and back down past Greenleaf Hut, down the Bridal Vale, Bridal, bridal Path, the old Bridal Path. Uh, uh, but you don't have to do it all. You can go up to these waterfalls and, and, and have a wonderful hike and, and, and stay at a lower elevation and you just enjoy that. And depending on that, whatever um, your inclinations are or, or your, how, how much energy you happen to have that day. And, and, uh, so, and that's described in the book, you know, where, where you could stop and turn around and still have a great hike, even if you don't do the whole thing. Of course, blueberry picking is very, very important. There are two mountains in the White Mountains called Blueberry Mountain. Um, this one's in the Evans Notch region. Um, there's also one in the western part of the White Mountain, almost at the, almost at the Connecticut River, uh, Blueberry Mountain. But that's, but they're certainly, it's a great thing. We've certainly done a lot of blueberry picking in when we're camping, and then be able to get. Um, Blueberry pancakes the next morning, uh, so it's it's a fine thing. And then there are places. Uh, I remember there were places where you can't even blueberries you can't get to because they're a little bit in too precarious a place. And then you see things like cedar waxwings, which can fly, and they, well, you, you you leave some of it over for the birds. You know, there's, there's plenty for everybody there, particularly in a good year. And natural features. Um, these are some fascinating natural features. Uh, Deer Hill is in the Evans Notch section, which is the eastern part of the White Mountains. Um, and uh, we, it's, it's really, what's really nice about it, it tends to be less, somewhat less well-traveled than the, than the sort of the Franconia Notch and, and the Presidential Range. The mountains aren't quite as high, so, um, uh, so they're, they're not quite as popular, but still, you know, still wonderful hikes. And Deer Hill, there's this quicksand, or uh, which is a, a bubbling area. Almost you feel like you're in Yellowstone or something like that. It's a spring that bubbles up. It's not a hot spring. And rumor has it that a horse fell in there once and is uh, down in there. Uh, but I don't think you'd ever want to really try and see that yourself or prove it, but that was years ago. And that's Janet Williams who, there, who was one of the AMC naturalists, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, but a wonderful birder, uh, ornithologist, uh, who was part of our, our group of AMC volunteer naturalists. Um, and the one on, the, on your right is uh, Pine Mountain is the smallest of the presidentials, if uh, I don't have a real map of that, but if it's the sort of northernmost of the presidentials, and it's something like 2,600 feet, so it's not that tall, but it is part of that range of the presidential mountains, and what you, it's got some wonderful geological features on it, that the, and those are glacial scratches. You can see the direction of the um, northwest towards southeast uh, on the rocks. It's also got some amazing tilting of the rocks, which I don't have a picture of, uh, which you say, you, the rock, the beds of the rocks, which are normally, strata are normally horizontal, and there's some where they've been uplifted, so they're totally vertical. Um, and so it's, you go, wow, that's, that's amazing. So you can see some amazing stuff there um, uh, with, with geology. Um, because the White Mountains, I mean, it was, historically, it was uh, this, probably the biggest the exploitation of it was for the trees, but secondarily was minerals and uh, glacial erratics. So that's Gabriel uh, at two different points in time. We like this. This is along the uh, Sugarloaf Trail, which is uh, uh, kind of around Bretton Woods. If you've gone to the ski area there, it's not far from the Bretton Woods ski area in Mount Washington Hotel, that section of the uh, of Good thing I put the dates in there, so I actually remember when those were taken. Uh, so, so he was nine, and now um, twenty-nine. No, I'm sorry, twenty-seven. Okay, and there's another glacial erratic, Glenn Boulder, um, a wonderful photo from our friend Ed Quinlan, uh, and often this was they were doing the four thousand footers, which is a whole other topic. Uh, of uh, 
accomplishment that now seems to be very popular. Our son has got one 4,000 footer left. And I think this was the, the last one they did. This is a, they, did, they stopped and did past Glen Boulder and then went on to Mount Isolation and, and took this wonderful photo of a rock. And this one you can see from Route 16. If you look on the side of Mount Washington, if you're driving up Route 16, not far from Pinkham Notch, the, the AMC facility there, you see that. Oh, of course, animals are always big there. Sometimes we're, you're lucky and you get to see them. Um, Nancy and I have a standard joke that we never see a moose in New Hampshire. So that picture was actually taken in Maine. <laughs> I have seen one or two in New Hampshire, but uh, maybe they're a little more obvious in Maine, I don't know. Uh, but squirrels and snakes and all kinds of things, a lot, certainly a lot of chipmunks. Um, and friendly birds, that's always a, whoops, let's see, did I just, yep, friendly birds. Um, Spruce grouse is a, is a, is a small chicken-like, not, or not small, medium-sized chicken-like bird that uh, is very tame. I remember seeing them standing right in front of us with, and dusting itself in a, in, on the trail. With, and birds do that to presumably get rid, help it get rid of parasites. And it was just sort of dusting its wings and s spreading sand or, or dust over itself. Um, Gray jays, uh, those are very tame. They're, they're the interesting thing, they, they will take your lunch if you let them. They're <laughs> I think I once had a stale peanut butter and jelly sandwich that they went after and got it. I think it was on Mount, Mount Crawford. And the interesting thing, one, another interesting thing about them is they, uh, they are used to hang around logging camps and the, the rumors, at least among the loggers, and this is 100 plus years ago, is that they represented the souls of uh, reincarnated souls of loggers who had been killed in accidents, which is why they seem to like to hang around logging camps. So uh, a very nice bird. We've, we've seen them out west. They're, they're all across the country. We saw them on that hike to the Cascades uh, uh, that we took in the Cascades. Um, but you see them in Mount Zealand. Another good place for them is Speckled Mountain. Uh, but you generally have to be fairly high up. Uh, and then loons, of course, uh, we were lucky at the Sawyer Pond, which is, if you want a very relatively easy first backpacking trip for, for you or your children or grandchildren, um, Sawyer Pond is about a mile and a half. There's, you know, it's, it's fairly gentle trail. It's got a lean-to and about five tent platforms on this beautiful pond. So, uh, the pond has a, you can go swimming in the pond and, and you can um, um, just enjoy the, the ambiance and, and stay overnight and go back uh, the next day or stay as long as you want. But it, it is a lovely spot and, and it was our, I think it was our children's first backpacking trip in the White Mountains uh, there. So we did that. <coughs> okay, insects, uh, maybe a little more of an acquired taste, but uh, there are a lot of wonderful insects you can see. I get fascinated by, I was really into dragonflies. I did a project for my Mass Audubon, in my Mass Audubon days on categorizing dragonflies across the state. And uh, this is a darner, which is a, a large dragonfly, and we'd see them at these very the lower bald areas, uh, like Bald Peak, and which is that's in, in the, that's sort of the back end of Cannon Mountain, so in the on the western side of uh, Cannon Mountain. White Admiral along Unknown Pond Trail. There, White Admirals they were very much attracted to moose droppings, so they're a lovely butterfly, but uh, with a very uh, but perhaps not the most sanitary of habits you wouldn't associate with butterflies. Uh, and then Comet is, uh, Luna Morth is actually taken at our friend's house, which is such a spectacular thing that I decided to count it as a White Mountain creature. And finally, uh, the tiger swallowtail, um, which is, uh, those you can see, certainly see these around here if you look carefully. I've, I've had them in my backyard, so even in Beverly. So, but then those some wonderful uh, looking butterfly, so. 
wildflowers. I'm, I'm particularly interested and fond of wildflowers. And in fact, my first attraction, the first program I ever did in the White Mountains was a hike with the Appalachian Mountain Club and, and, and a precursor uh, of, of a mass Audubon group called Habitat. And we also did it with the Mass Hort, Hort Society. We'd, we did a weekend in Pinkham Notch, which is right in the heart of uh, the White Mountains. And we did a trip up to the Alpine Garden area. Because in the spring, in June, um, there's a wonderful assortment of Alpine Arctic flowers. So the Alpine Garden in June, if you look on your left there, those are plants that are you find up in Iceland and Labrador. Uh, and so you think of the, the presidential range and to some extent the Franconia range as these Arctic outposts. And uh, Diapentia is the white one and the, and, the, and the pink one, or mauve I guess, is a, called Lapland Rose Bay, which is actually a mini rhododendron. But you see how small they are. Uh, these plants are uh, no, never more than a few inches off the ground because of the wind and the cold weather and the snow cover. Um, and so it's a real feature among naturalists to go up and see these Arctic Alpine flowers because if you didn't, you could drive, you could drive several days up to Labrador or you could drive three hours from Boston or here and, and drive up Mount Washington and uh, see the same thing. And of course the uh, woodland wildflowers, uh, painted trillium is a, is a lovely one. Um, there's a wonderful assortment of, of wildflowers that are there in May um, before the leaves come out in the trees. And, and so if, but you have to be really brave because May is also black fly season. So you've got to really want to see them. Uh, um, so yeah, the, so trillium is one of the more showy of those, which typically blooms there probably around the beginning of June. And then every once in a while you run into something exotic like this purple fringed orcas uh, along the Zealand Trail. And fungi are always attractive. Uh, looking what is a, this time of year is a good time for fungi. So if, what, if you miss the wildflowers in June, May, June, uh, you can go look at fungi like this black trumpet and coral fungus, turkey tails, and then looking at our, our sun, inspecting very carefully at this fun mushroom along the Pemi, Pemi tra Jawasset Trail. All right, now to mention we did, we included in, in the later editions of the book more on the um, off-season trails that you can hike. Uh, Nancy and I had a wonderful hike along the 19-mile Brook Trail, which is uh, uh, in, it's east of um, Pinkham Notch, and it goes to a, a hut, a Carter Notch hut, which is open all year on a caretaker basis. Um, and they do, they do keep a fire going, so if you really need to warm up, you can go into the main building and warm up, and then you go back into your bunk and, and bundle up in your sleeping bag. Um, and then there's uh, Mount Israel is actually in the southern part of the White Mountains in, in the same round Sandwich, uh, the town of Sandwich. Uh, but there's just some wonderful hiking you can do. And it has the advan two advantages. There's many, many less people. And also the leaves aren't on the trees. So you tend to be able to see, get more vistas without having to hike necessarily up to a, a ledge or a peak. So, so it's, it's a, it's a very nice time to go hiking if, if you don't mind the cold and, and if you, have, you have, certainly need the proper equipment. Yeah. Our son did a whole course for the, through the AMC on winter hiking and he was out almost every other weekend the last past winter um, you know, testing out and learning how to do it. Okay, so these are some of the classic hikes. I would call them classics. They're kind of every, on everybody's list of favorite hikes, getting back to that theme of what are favorite hikes. There's Mount Washington, as I mentioned. There's a couple of things. That the June in, in, in the Alpine Garden is, is once again one of the features. See, my orientation is more towards what's the nature have to, <laughs> to show you, even more than getting up to the very top of a peak. So, uh, but that's, that's just me. Um, but you can also go, there's also wonderful uh, flowers in, later in the season in 
in Tuckman's Ravine, in the ravines along the waterways where these yellow flowers called arnica, uh, which is, I think, if you're into herbal herbalism, uh, it's uh, one of the herbs uh, that people talk about and uh, a bunch of other ones, but it's uh, just a, another nice time to be out walking and um, perhaps the weather's a little more reliable than in June. First time I went up to the White Mountains, I did a backpack, not first time, but first time I did a backpacking trip with my brother in June, we had like two feet of snow, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's very typical. Okay, the Franconia Ridge, I mentioned that, um, but that's, to me, it's just an just a incredibly scenic uh, ridge. And uh, one of the questions I asked the geologist, if you saw the presidential range, it's very broad and flat. And this one, Franconia Ridge, however, is more pointy and sharp. So you feel like you're walking on the, the Great Wall of China or something like that uh, along the Franconia Ridge Trail. That's Nancy and Allison uh, uh, on the trail there. Um, and it had to do with just the mountain, the mountain glaciers which happened to hit this area and gouge out the sides and scoured out the sides. For some reason, that never didn't happen in the presidential range. So nonetheless, incredibly scenic. And this is part of that loop I mentioned before, which had with, with the falling waters trail, where I showed you the waterfall and our two children. And um, if you do the whole loop, this is what you'll get to on a nice day. Yeah. The nice thing about having these turn-off places, if the weather turns you. You, uh, you can always back off, but if it's a great day, you, you, have, you can be treated to this. Nobody else there. Yeah, nobody was there. This was, uh, I forget what time of the year it was we did this hike. But yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. This was before pandemic, of course. <laughs> Mount Willard, um, there's various quotes that said, says, uh, I, should, I should have the quote there, but there was a 1880s, uh, um, description and saying something to the effect of no, no hike gives you such a wonderful view with relatively moderate effort as the view from Mount Willard. And that's a classic U-shaped valley. So if you're, if you're a geologist or a geologist student, uh, this is the scoured, you can see the glacier went, just went right through this valley here, scoured out things. Um, and uh, that's Route 302, <laughs> which comes up, it's a wonderful, ride, one of the beautiful scenic rides. And the other scar on the side of the mountain is the scenic, Conway Scenic Railway. And so, and, that, and I was just reading in the, the Boston Globe travel section, they said that's a wonderful thing to take during the fall season is to take the Conway Scenic Railway. Um, interesting, if you see that scar on the mountain, that's Mount Willie, um, that's historically of, of one of the melodramatic, tragic stories of the White Mountains was the Willie family. Uh, this is somewhere around in the early, mid-1800s. They had a house roughly below that scar uh, when there weren't too many people living there. And they had a house and they had help, uh, hands to help out and, and the family, I think there were five of them, plus husband, wife, and a couple of hands. And, that it had been a rainy year, kind of like this, and they all of a sudden heard the mountain starting to tumble down as a landslide, and they ran out of their house. They thought it would be safer, but they were all buried and died. And that's why when you get the willies, and presumably that's the, the derivation of that term, getting the willies. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the even more tragic is the house was left untouched. So somehow it, the, the landslide had split. So if they had just stayed where they in their house, they would have been fine. But it took several days, of course, for people to find them. Uh, and uh, unfortunate, it was unfortunate. But now it's a historic site, and that's actually the scar from the landslide. And but you know, who knows? Something like this could happen again. I think we're probably better prepared for it. But still, Welsh and Dicky. Um, this was when I was asking, particularly the AMC folks, Walter and Nancy, about, for hikes with children. They said this was one of the ones that was most suggested. It's in the southern part of Waterville Valley, and uh, it, they're not huge mountains at 2,600, 2,700 feet, 
but it's a five mile loop and it, you get wonderful views on top as you can see you're looking out over the Franconia Ridge there from the summit and um, it's also since it's early and it's southern uh, it tends to be snow free a little earlier in the year than um, say some of the higher peaks uh, so it's a wonderful hike and and uh, the other thing about Welsh the mountain is it's if you're a botanist if, is that it's, it has a very uh, uncommon pine tree that only grows there and one other place in the White Mountains called um, um, Pinus banksiana. Um, and so uh, for, for me, that was an, an additional feature. But by and large, it's just a wonderful loop hike uh, and a good um, place for taking a child for their first serious mountain hike. There's some ledges and you've got to do some scrambling, uh, but not bad, not, not really bad. Arethusa Falls, uh, this, uh, this is uh, the largest waterfall in New Hampshire, so as such it's going to be a popular hiking. We, we did this hike in the middle of, that was December, like about a year ago. That was a year ago we did that. Uh, in winter you get wonderful ice sculptures, natural ice sculptures from, from the uh, from, from, from the waterfall, but very popular uh, place to go. And they're, they're, these are some of the ponds, I, I, and I probably first put the slide together, the ponds off the beaten track, and I had to sort of qualify it. Uh, Unknown Pond um, is up in the Kil Kilkenny, or the northern parts of the White Mountains, and uh, there is a camp uh, ground there, um, or a backcountry campsite, I should say. So with 10 platforms and you can hike there and there's a few 4,000 footers that you can reach from Unknown Pond, <coughs> Mount Cabot being one of them. Mountain Pond was another place I thought I had discovered. Uh, it's sort of, it's uh, east, northeast of Jackson and it's got a wonderful loop trail of about two and a half, three miles around it. Um, there is a lean-to there, uh, so you could stay overnight if you want. Um, didn't seem like uh, too many people really knew about it. it. The other thing about some of these hikes, and Mountain Pond's a good example, it's, you reach it from uh, the trailhead, you reach from, you have to go four miles on a dirt road, which they don't plow in winter. So that's written in the book, the certain hikes that are pretty much inaccessible in, in winter because the road access is not plowed. And I know a Mountain Pond is one of those. Um, Shell Pond is uh, some uh, more recent, uh, that was added to the last, uh, the last edition of the book. What's always fun and hard about the, putting these hikes is when they tell me they want five new ones, because they always say, we want, to hit, we want you to be able to save five new hikes. That means I have to subtract five so it doesn't get too big. So uh, it was always a challenge to figure out which ones, which hikes are no longer functional, you know, so. Anyway, but Shell Pond is just so lovely. Uh, you see a beautiful fall day, a lot of wildlife there, with beavers and various waterfowl here. So it's just uh, very, very nice, uh, very nice, uh, and a very uh, a level walk. So this is a great one for kids. Um, it's about I think it's 2.7 miles, and fairly and fairly level, but beautiful vistas on a beautiful fall day. Mount Eisenhower. Um, and you guys have done that one, right? Yep. Mount Eisenhower, um, you see, we've hiked, we just got back from being out west uh, in the Tetons. And one of the nice things about when you hike out west, they actually believe in switchbacks. <laughs> in the White Mountains, for whatever reason, they go pretty much go straight up. And there's the disadvantages of that is often the trails get more heavily eroded. Um, but Edmonds was the, had the philosopher, philosophy of, he was a trail builder, of making things so that a horse could get up there. So the Edmonds Path, I, when we were hiking it, um, you can see there's some cribbing along the side there. He, he tried to make it so that the trails had much, much more in the way of switchbacks. So that was a different school of thought. So that's why it's, one, it's a really nice trail and it goes up to above. Mount Eisenhower is something like 4,900 feet, so it gets gets up high up there, up up until the Alpine Zone, which is uh, 
the picture on your right, and you get beautiful views on top there, of, uh, looking across to Mount Washington and, and uh, Mount uh, Jefferson. So, um, but it's much more switch back, and, and uh, so it's a great way to get up into the high elevations without totally destroying your knees oh, on the way down and as well. So, um, another really nice high elevation hike that is well graded is the Mount Musilaki, which is in the western part of the White Mountain. It's this big, broad summit. Uh, and a lot of it is along a stream, a rushing stream. In fact, every time there's a big storm, that trail, that, that trail, and I took that picture, was probably in like, probably 2008, 2009. And they've had to relocate the trail because Hurricane Irene came through and uh, re re plumbed the area. So every, anything along a stream often has to get re redone uh, when there's a big storm that goes through the mountains. Uh, here's a, a recent one we just added. Um, um, it's along the Mad River Valley. It has some nice features. You walk along a stream, the Mad River, which is mad only after a rainstorm, but can be pretty high. And then you go through a series of boulders called the Davis Boulders. And then you go to Goodrich Rock, which is a huge glacial erratic, uh, a, a glacial erratic, I, I should have mentioned before, like Glen Boulder is a rock that was deposited in an area carried by a glacier to a different location from its origin and deposited uh, somewhere else. And that's what Goodrich Rock is. This is in Waterville Valley. Rock hounding is a nice, this is one of our, one of our favorite hikes is in the Evans Notch area um, where you could actually go to a, an open quarry uh, wouldn't call it a mine, but uh, and you can get these huge books of mica, little huge things. And they used to get the feldspar there, which is a, a, a feldspar and mica were the two main things. Occasionally, they'd get things like agates and uh, and uh, beryl. Um, and then and the view from the top is also nice over over Horseshoe Pond. So it's a uh, lovely combines of mining and mines and uh, and uh, a view and a hike up, so it's got a lot of interest to it. There's also, if you ever have done the Sugar Loafs, there's a mine on North Sugar Loaf where you can get black quartz. So uh, if you're interested in rocks, there's places and there's some leaflets and interest. Yeah, you can collect things for your own use. If you want to sell them, then you have to get a permit. But there are <coughs> rules and regulations. But uh, we just did things with our own. Uh, we'd collect things for our own, so we probably have too many of these things around our house still. Okay, and then there's a section of essays in the book. So that that kind of goes through the, a lot of the hikes, a section of essays. Um, so there's something like 15 essays. So one of the main ones that I kind of uh, enhanced this time had to do with climate change, because that's obviously a topic on everybody's mind, and storms. Um, there's ice storms. Uh, those birches are actually bent over and would actually re-sprout if when the tip hits the, bar, the ground, but by ice, that's the weight of the ice on it. And uh, that's a mountain ash with berries that encrusted in ice, so ice is a big factor in there. Mudslides and erosion caused by streams uh, overflowing. Uh, our son was going to do a backpacking trip with the AMC at, in the Wild River, which this is part of, uh, and had to get canceled because the trail was washed out, uh, which does happen quite uh, along these, as I said, along some of these major streams. Uh, you get erosion of the stream bank. This is the Wild River again in, in the Evans Notch area. So uh, you get things undercutting. And it leads to a lot of trail maintenance. This is a, a bridge that had to be rebuilt after uh, a tropical storm I read. That was a real big one here because it was a huge amount of rain in a short period of time. It was, by the time it hit the White Mountains, it wasn't a hurricane force wind, so it was because they call it a tropical storm. But, uh, but still, there was a huge amount of water, which, which took a, the, the Forest Service and its partners, AMC and the other hiking clubs, 
years to rebuild. This one was just rebuilt probably five years ago, which shows you that sometimes it can take a while. So, so in the meantime, you have to figure out how you're going to get around the, the different places. Um, I talked to the people. The AMC has a scientific staff that is, is very good and very well known. And they do a lot of studies having to do with um, impacts of things like water withdrawals from ski areas. But they're also doing a lot on climate change and how the vegetation affects those different layers along the mountains uh, uh, of different types of vegetation. That alpine zone is, is likely to get constrained because as the water, as it gets warmer, the, 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 the communities move up the mountain, uh, and that's what's expected. But David Pavelkother, who's a forest ecologist at the AMC, said he was, he, he stressed that the forests in the White Mountains are very resilient. When you get those storms along the streams, they do wipe out things right along the stream. But the overall effect on the forest is negligible. And part of it is there's a lot of moisture, as we know. It gets back to our original theme of today. Uh, so with all that moisture that's there, the, the forest does recover pretty well. Um, and so they haven't seen that much change in the forest itself uh, as a result of these storms. Uh, things seem to recover. Obviously, if the erosion happens, then it's a different story. But that's just in the immediate vicinity. Um, here's a good picture from a place called Lookout Ledge, another lovely hike that's not, uh, too, that's not too, too bad, not too rigorous. But you get this wonderful vista. But what, what you see here was um, this photo was taken in April. You see three different layers of types of vegetation. Uh, which I talk about boundaries. So the, the bottom layer is broadleaf forest. That's at the lower elevation uh, where you see tree, the snow through the trees. The dark layer on the side of the mountain is a boreal forest, which is more typical of northern, sort of northern part of Canada or mid part of Canada, but also here in the White Mountains and the, anything above like 2,500 feet, 2,000 to 2,500 feet up to about tree line. And then there's the alpine zone. Uh, so there's a boundary between the northern hardwoods and the boreal forest, and the boreal forest and alpine zone. And there's concern about how that's going to be changing. Particularly, the alpine zone is a rare community in New England. And the only place in New England where we have an alpine community is. Mount Washington, which is about uh, in the presidential, which is about eight square miles. There's probably about maybe one square mile along the Franconia Ridge, and less in in uh, Mount Madison, uh, Mount Mansfield, and, and and in the Adirondacks. So Mount Washington, well, the presidential has a lion's share of alpine habitats in New England, and uh, that's uh, a concern. But though lately, at least the, the short term results is things haven't changed all that much. Uh, so there may be interesting things going on with wind and exposure that keeps the forest more or less and the alpine zone more or less maintains the boundaries that we see because it's not just temperature, there's also exposure and wind. And as you've probably heard from Mount Washington in that area, it gets a lot of wind up there. So uh, still remains to be seen and something the Appalachian Mountain Club is and its partners are looking at. Now, there's logging history. One of the essays has to do with logging history, and that's a very strong part of the, uh, of the history of this area. There's still logging that goes on, um, but it's done in a much more uh, um, circumspect way than in the, in the, around 1900 was the, the height of logging, where whole areas were just, were, uh, were uh, just clear cut. And Zealand was one of its prime areas where areas where it, not, it was logged, cut down, and then they had logging railroads, which had sparks, and they had huge forest fires as well as logging. So Zealand and then the area around the Pemigewasset Wilderness, which is if you've gone up the Kankamangas Highway, that area there was a very intensely logged uh, area. And what's amazing is it all grows back. See, if you go there now, if you hike this now, you wouldn't even know. In fact, this vista is grown in now. 
it used to be what my favorite vista just about from the White Mountains and you stand right at a bench outside a Zealand hut and now it's all grown in so this picture was taken 20, 20 years ago or 30 years ago almost. Uh, Lincoln Woods Trail, that very straight trail uh, is, was because they had what was a logging railroad trail that went in there and took the logs out. Um, makes it for now a very easy hike or cross-country ski trail. Um, and the Wild River Valley, the, the town of Hastings is, Wild River once again is in the eastern White Mountains in Maine, the border of Maine. And uh, there's actually down there was a town called Hastings, which used to have a post office, bars, school. And then the Wild River at one point around 1910 lived up to its name and wiped everything out and it was never rebuilt, the whole community. So um, logging is certainly a, a strong part of the history. So one of the essays deals with the logging history. Uh, bird guilds, yeah, I work for Audubon. I gotta put something in about birds. Yeah. So these are the different bird guilds are, are you know, we were hiking along, I think we've maybe all had this experience where you'll see nothing, nothing, and all of a sudden you'll see this uh, group of birds will come by, and they're usually different species, chickadees, juncos, nuthatches, sometimes a woodpecker, other things, and they'll come by all together, and then they'll, they'll be gone. They're kind of like they're traveling. Guilds are from the old Dutch, uh, you know, uh, uh, union type of uh, co cooperatives. Uh, they would seem to be interacting. They each have different um, uh, roles they play, different ways of feeding so they don't compete. And then having more eyes there to look out for predators uh, is uh, so, so uh, you'll see these guilds of birds as you're hiking along. Beavers, very strong. Uh, a lot going on with beavers. Um, we had uh, this one beaver just kept coming closer and closer to us, uh, even though we had a dog with us. This was Maya. Uh, didn't seem to mind, but beavers have had a very strong um, effect on the landscape. They create dams. Sometimes the dams, the, the dams will evolve into meadows. Uh, and so as around here, beavers are having a very strong effect. So uh, essay on beavers. And finally, the last thing to talk about is just the history. There's an essay, a couple of essays having to deal with the history. The history of the White Mountains would be incomplete without talking about the Crawfords. Uh, the Crawfords uh, were among the original settlers was Abel Cross Crawford, who was known as the old patriarch. His son, Ethan Allen Crawford, was the giant of the mountain, and he and uh, Abel built the Crawford Path, which was the first trail maintained up, up the White Mountains. Uh, and people like Thoreau went, went up those, the trail and um, a bunch of other uh, notables. Uh, and uh, that trail is still maintained and a very popular trail. So uh, the Crawford, there's Ethan Pond, which is a lovely spot with a, with a uh, shelter on it, and some tent platforms if you ever want to go there. Uh, so they're, they're part of the, uh, there's a whole book of like Lucy Crawford, where she describes a lot of the early times in the White Mountains. She's the one who really talked about the, the incident with the Wiley family. Uh, if you want to read more about it, it's a history of, the, I think it's called History of the White Mountains by Lucy Crawford, uh, Ethan's uh, wife. <coughs> Finally, the last thing, uh, we, this is, we did this hike about a month, month ago, uh, and uh, it's, it goes to Bridal Vale Falls. This is one of the very, one of those interesting, well, I find it an interesting incident, or incident, uh, anecdote, I guess it'll say. So it's a lovely walk in the backside of Cannon Mountain, the waterfall, uh, lovely waterfall. And it used to be popular among, the, there was a place called the Sugar Hill Inn, which is um, west of this. And, and in the old days, um, people would go there, and, and they would the guests would ride on horseback or hike into along this copper line trail, which goes to Bridal Vale Falls, and um, enjoy the ambiance. And one of the people who used to come there was Betty Davis, the actress. And 
she used to come stay there, and they said that uh, she used to be there for the to uh, kind of as a, a great retreat from her intense period of movie making in Hollywood, and this, and there was a person uh, who was uh, Farnsworth, who's uh, who his job it was was to make people happy at the end and and be a guide, sort of like a facilitator and a guide. So he would take people out to these. Uh, along the Copper Mine Trail. And the short of it was they, she fell in love with him. So at one point she deliberately got herself lost on the trail, knowing that he would be sent to find her. And he did. And the short of it was they ended up getting married. And they actually lived at, in the Sugar Hill area for a while. Unfortunately, a tragedy stuck. And he died a couple of years later. He fell down some stairs. It kind of, somebody as vigorous as he was, he fell down some stairs and died. But, but then what happened is a couple of years after that tragedy happened, the, this appeared in the middle of Coppermine Brook, this plaque, it says, in memoriam to Arthur Farnsworth, the keeper of stray ladies. Pickett's, Pickett's was the name of the, the inn, presented by a grateful one. So, and Nancy and I, we, we, we found this when we were looking first time in 1995 for the first edition. We looked about two years ago, didn't find it, but we just went out this last year and found it again. It's a little different because uh, we couldn't get, the stream has changed a bit, but if you look really carefully and follow the directions, <laughs> you might get lucky and see it along the Copper Mine Trail. So uh, a lot of interesting stories. And that's it, thank you. So, anybody got any questions or comments or their own experiences? Yeah? What's the difference between a waterfall and a cascade? Oh, gosh. Well, I think of a cascade as, I, mean, I would say a waterfall is a type of cascade, but cascades could be smaller or larger, tumble where water tumbles off. But I don't know if there's a real technical difference. Distinction, yeah. Never thought about that. I have to look that one up for sure. Right? But I would say I think of a cascade as you think of a series of cascades as rapids, where the water is tumbling around, but isn't necessarily falling from a, a height. Uh, waterfalls from a height. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Fifty years ago, you didn't. <laughs> but now you need to make a, um, yeah, you guys just did it. So uh, I would say certainly for a summer weekend, but you really need to make reservations where, wherever you, whenever you want to go. Yeah. I would say even during the week. Yeah. Well, the thing will accommodate um, emergencies. Uh, when we were up there this past week, um, there were several groups that were staying at a higher hut that, you know, the, the hut masters would communicate and say, we've got six of your people, so don't expect them for dinner. And, you know, we had to change our plans um, because it was like thunderstorms so, and um, we stayed in a lower hut. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they, if they can accommodate you. Yeah. Um, yeah, the hut crews can talk to each other, so, and there's certainly weather contingencies that happen and it require you to change, so. Definitely, uh, 466-2727, 603 <laughs> is the number, if you want to call. But I, I would assume you could do it online as well, yeah. Okay, anybody else? Um, I've do got some books to sell if, you, if you're interested, and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you.